<laughs> Today, we're talking about paper airplanes that could fly forever. Welcome to Impossible Science. Hey everyone, it's Jason Latimer, world champion of magic, coming to you with another Impossible Science, the show where we take an impossible topic and we bring it to life through science. Now, today's topic, levitation, with paper airplanes that fly forever. Now, what you just saw with the fan, that's a total illusion, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, today I'm gonna show you how to make one of these. This is a walk-along glider, or forever flyer. Believe it or not, these will actually fly forever, as long as you're willing to walk along the side of it. Now, I'm gonna go over a step-by-step -step process of how to make them, but if you didn't understand how they work, it would look like magic. So let's cover the four forces of flight. When you throw a frisbee, there's four forces at play. Thrust, drag, lift, and weight. Your arm gave the frisbee thrust. That's the force that moves an aircraft in the direction of motion. On a plane, it's the engine, the propeller, or even the rocket that creates the thrust that is moving the plane forward through the air. But drag is the force that is opposite to the direction of motion. Drag is caused by the friction of air molecules and it's the reason the frisbee slows down. Lift is the force that holds up the frisbee. It's caused by a difference in air pressure between high air pressure below and low air pressure above the frisbee. And weight, which is caused by gravity, that's the force that brings the frisbee back to the ground. Lift is opposite to weight, thrust is opposite to drag. If the force of lift is greater than the weight, the aircraft will rise. If thrust is greater than drag, the aircraft not only moves forward, it speeds up as it goes. So when we're talking about steady flight at a constant altitude, at a constant speed, all forces are balanced. All right, now that we understand the four forces of flight, let's apply them towards a paper airplane. Now, a glider doesn't really have thrust, so we're gonna use the other forces. Weight has to do with the paper itself. I strongly recommend the lightest paper you can find. Encyclopedia paper, phone book paper, as long as your parents are okay with that. At the end of the episode, I'm gonna show you how to make this walk along glider because it won't work for every paper airplane. It's gonna work for a paper airplane that you can walk alongside of, which will help us with our drag. Which brings me to this. This is gonna help us create lift with an updraft. It's a panel that's uh, two feet by three feet. And I have a couple paper clips here for a launch pad. And as I walk forward, air is gonna actually blow against this board and it's gonna keep the paper airplane up. This paper airplane with this panel makes a paper airplane that flies forever. Well, as long as you can walk along the side of it. So let's get this thing going. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> and you can get them to ascend and descend. All right, now that you know these things can fly forever, let me show you how to make them. Let me break down the four forces of flight so we understand what's happening here. See, weight, it's very important we get a very light piece of paper because the heavier the paper, the faster it's gonna fly. That means the faster you're gonna have to run behind this thing to keep it up in the air. So I highly recommend very light paper. The next one has to do with drag. That's the air resistance pushing on this plane. That comes down to the shape of how this is made. This air resistance of drag is offset by thrust. Now, normally when you think about a glider, you think there is no thrust, there is no motor. Well, in this case, thrust and lift are connected by this. Now, this board is uh, two feet by three feet, and I've got two paper clips on the very end here. Now, that just helps us set the paper airplane on top, so when I start walking, I just tip the board forward that's already in flying position. Now, the paper airplane it's flying right about here. And why does it do that? Well, this board creates an updraft. As you walk through the air holding this board, you're actually plowing through the air, much like a snowplow. And this is just sitting on that air and it's descending down. Now, the air rushing up is creating lift, but it's also because of its shape. As the air pushes up through here, it's being deflected. And as it's being deflected this way, it's pushing the airplane forward. So you're getting thrust from that panel you're also getting lift from that panel. So lift and thrust in this case are connected. So now that we understand we have our weight, we have our drag, we have our lift, and we have our thrust. 
Let me show you how to make it. Now I'm gonna be doing it with cardstock. Again, I highly recommend using tissue paper. I'm gonna be using a cardstock so it's easier to see on, on the screen. And to do this, you're gonna need some scissors, a pen, and a ruler. With the piece of paper that you're gonna need, it needs to be 17 centimeters by 22 centimeters. Now the first fold you're gonna do across this diagonal line here. And then you do it again from the other angle. The next fold you're gonna need to do, it gets a little complicated. We're gonna push in and fold down the triangle across like this. So now that you've folded this spot, see these lines? That's where you're gonna fold next. You're gonna fold up here, and you're gonna fold up here. Now, the next one, once you fold it in, we're gonna fold again on these lines that I provided here. You fold in there, and you fold in there. Okay? Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. You wanna take these triangles and you wanna fold them down and in. Okay. Then you wanna fold this top triangle, the last remaining piece down. And if you look closely, there's a little gap in here and there's a little gap on the other side. You're just gonna tuck these triangles in there. Now I'm rushing through this for you guys, but you want to make this as exact as possible. And when you're done with that section, it's gonna look like this. Once you're there, take this fold and we're gonna flip it over. And we're gonna fold right here. Now where do I find that fold? It's because this edge is gonna line up with dead center here. You can actually just crimp it and fold right here. And you can see where the center is. And this fold is gonna be right there. And you're gonna do the same to the opposite side. Okay. Making sure. Now that you fold it here, this is actually coming up on the most difficult fold. We, once we fold it in like this, we're gonna be folding from the center back to the outside. It's not exactly halfway. You wanna put your finger here at this corner and you want to fold back this is the hardest fold. So this fold right here, there's a little corner. Take a close look at this. There's a little corner that's coming out right there. You see that spot? So it's kind of a diagonal. And you're gonna do that to both sides. And you get that by putting your finger there and folding it back. And you can see that little, little tiny triangle coming out on the side right there. And it'll look like this. And we're almost done. Because then you're gonna take this and you're gonna unfold it. Now I've put a line here to show you where those folds just came from. Here comes a little bit of cutting here. We're gonna take a ruler, and you're gonna draw a line from the center point here to here. You actually really just need to where it intersects, but I wanna show you how to make that line. You really just need to go from here to there, but in order for everybody to follow along at home, it's from the center point of the plane to the corner. And we're gonna look at this point right here. We're also gonna do it for the other side, so I might as well since my ruler's out. Perfect. And that's the intersection I'm talking about. All right, now grab a pair of scissors. If you don't have adult supervision, have somebody ask, help you with this part. And you wanna to cut to that intersection, and then you wanna cut out that inside triangle. triangle looking thing actually. It's technically not a triangle. But that's the scientist in me coming out. So you've now cut this piece out of this. One last fold. Now we're gonna create what's called an air break on this paper airplane. We're actually raising the center section and then we're going to fold here and try to get it to fold midway up this back part. Midway between here and here we're gonna get it to fold there. So it's bowed up, you see that upwards triangle right there? Another way to do it is to just put your thumb here, peel up here, and crease. You can see it happen already. And that's it. Now to test this ready for flight, you wanna just go ahead and throw it like a regular paper airplane. These little tabs here, you can actually fold up right where the cut is 
And this will help you steer the plane because what you really want is a plane that's gonna fly straight. So go ahead and throw this plane. If it flies to the left or to the right, use your tabs to correct. And there you have it, a paper airplane that can fly forever. Now, if you didn't know this was possible, this would look like magic. Just remember, levitation's always just a balance of forces. And in this case, <laughs> as long as you're willing to run behind it, you can make this airplane fly forever. Now, if you do it, let me know in the comments below. And if you like just the idea of taking an impossible topic and bringing it to life through science, make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, stay curious, because the right question changes everything. We're talking about paper airplanes that could fly? Nope, they can't. Forever or not, doesn't matter. Hmm. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen that way. How weird is that? Today's topic, objects that can actually attract or objects that can actually repel that you didn't think were magnetic. That's right, today's episode is about magnetic fruit. Welcome to Impossible Science. Hey everyone, it's Jason Latimer, world champion of magic, coming to you with another Impossible Science, the show where we take an impossible topic and we bring it to life through science. Now today's topic, magnetic fruit. Now, what you just saw with the banana and the lemon and the strawberry, that is an illusion, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, today I'm gonna prove to you that your fruit is magnetic and it's gonna blow your mind. Today we're learning about different magnetic materials. Now, most people are familiar with ferromagnetic materials. This magnet is attracted to the iron in this nail. Now, if you've ever played with a magnet before, then you know that opposites attract and light charges repel. But when you're dealing with iron versus a magnet, regardless of the orientation, whether it's north or south pole, ferromagnetic materials are attracted to the magnet. Cool, right? And it's a pretty strong force. I mean, it's enough to actually defy gravity. But there's other types of magnetic materials, paramagnetic and diamagnetic materials. Both of them are very weak forces. And without getting into the quantum mechanics of how they actually work, Paramagnetic materials are always attracted to a magnet and diamagnetic materials are repelled from a magnet. But again, a very weak force. Diamagnetic repels, paramagnetic attracts. Paramagnetic materials are gonna be stuff like aluminum, platinum, manganese, and diamagnetic materials is something like gold, copper, silver, zinc, but also water. Yeah, water is diamagnetic. This next experiment is gonna blow your mind. Now for this experiment, I'm gonna be using a neodymium magnet. Now it has to be this type of magnet because this is extremely strong. If you use the little black magnets that you find on your refrigerator, it won't be strong enough. Definitely get one of these. You can get them at a hardware store. You might find smaller ones and you can stack them together. But for me, I'm gonna be using a one inch neodymium magnet. And I took a beaker and I filled it up with just water here. And it's just sitting on foam right now to float on the water. And I'm gonna put this magnet really close to it, but I'm not gonna to touch it. And I'm gonna see if I can push this beaker across the water. It's going, see if I can build the momentum. That's so cool. So we know water is repelling from the magnet because it's diamagnetic. Well, fruit has water in it. Since water is diamagnetic, that means fruit that have a lot of water in them will repel from a magnet. We're gonna see these forces using this. This is what's known as a torsion pendulum. It sounds really fancy, but really what I'm doing is suspending this little stick using really thin thread. I tried fishing line, but it seemed to be a little too rigid, so it would twist up. This allows us to see very, very weak forces. I'm just gonna put a grape on each end of this torsion pendulum. You can use a straw, you can use a stick, but the real secret is to get them to balance. Now, with this setup, we should be able to see the grape repel from the magnet. So let's give it a shot. There it goes. <laughs> How weird is that? Your fruit is magnetic, diamagnetic. So if it repels water, how about ice?
We know water is diamagnetic and we know the fruit is diamagnetic because of the water, which means ice should be diamagnetic. So I decided to just freeze some ice cubes and stick them on each side of the stick. I have to work quickly because it's melting. <laughs> get this side to repel. It's working, it's just melting so much. See if I can just get it to a teeter back and forth. How crazy is that? So we've seen a lot of diamagnetic material, whether it was water, water in fruit, or ice. But what about paramagnetic material? The stuff that actually will attract towards a magnet, but it's just a super weak force. Well, we can use the same device here, this torsion pendulum, to actually see a paramagnetic material. We're gonna just crumple these into a ball. I'm doing this so that you guys know there's nothing inside this aluminum. And then I'll put another one over here. And hopefully this magnet is strong enough to attract the aluminum. Because remember, this is paramagnetic, weak force that attracts. Diamagnetic is weak force that repels. So let's try it. It's working. And there you have it, magnetic aluminum. Well, it was always magnetic. It just wasn't strong enough to see it. We just made the impossible possible through science. We found out that aluminum is paramagnetic. We found out that water is diamagnetic. We found out the fruit will actually repel from a magnet because it's diamagnetic because of the water. And if that blew your mind, make sure you let me know. Click the like button, share this video with your friends. And if you wanna learn about more goofy experiments, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And until next time, stay curious because the right question changes everything. Have you ever wanted to make your drawings come to life? No, I mean actually move. Yeah, so have I. Welcome to Impossible Science. Hey everyone, it's Jason Latimer, the world champion of magic. Now today's topic, drawings that animate on their own. Now, what you just saw with that dry erase board, well, that's obviously an illusion. But today, I'm gonna show you an experiment where your drawing will come to life, and it uses one of these. That's right, a dry erase marker. So grab one of these, and I'll meet you in the kitchen. Wait, a drawing that can actually move? Yeah, pretty cool, right? Now, before I can get into how to do that, I wanted to go over this little science experiment with you. See, you can do this at home. Take some oil, take some water, and if you pour them in a glass, they'll separate themselves. Now, anybody who's ever mixed oil and water knows they will never mix up because they have different chemical bonds. But what I wanted to show you is that the oil will always sit on top of the water because they have different densities. See, oil is less dense than water. Oh, wait, what's density? <laughs> Let me explain. Density is the relationship between an object's mass and its volume. Mass is the amount of matter or substance that makes up an object, while volume refers to the amount of space an object takes up. In other words, density is how heavy something is for its size. Imagine a scale with a block of water on one side and the same size block of wood on the other. Given the same volume, the water is heavier for its size and it will tip the scale. The block of wood is less dense than water, so it would sit on top, which is why wood floats on water. If we swap out that block of wood for the same size block of metal, we can see that the metal is heavier, so we can see why the water would be on top. The metal block is more dense than water, so it would sit on the bottom. If an object floats, it's because it's less dense than the fluid it's sitting on. And if an object sinks, it's because it's more dense than the fluid it was put into. Okay, so now we know why oil was sitting on top of water. It was less dense than the water. And why is that important? Because dry erase markers have two major ingredients. The first is alcohol, that's used to dry out the ink. The second is the releasing agent, that allows the ink to be rubbed off. That releasing agent is made of silicone oils. Wait, did you say oils? Yes, the same oils that sit on top of water. Check this out. If you take a dry erase marker and you draw a figure, we let it dry first. 
the alcohol evaporates and now we have only the silicone oils. We take some water and we carefully pour it into this tray. Let's see if I can get him to go. Ah, there he goes. Woohoo! It's party time! It's pretty cool, right? I can even get him to tilt. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I could make a surfer. All right, I'll show you some cool things you can do with it. Now, you wanna draw on a smooth glass surface, something that's not porous. And you can be super creative. You can have different colors, you can have different drawings, but the thinner the lines, the harder it is to keep the picture together when it comes off the bottom. Okay, now that we know how to make drawings come off the surface, you can actually transfer the surface. Let me explain. Draw it in a small bowl, and then lower it into a tub of more water. Do it slowly, try not to break the image, now, once you have that image floating around on the surface, you can put it on your skin. Watch. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so cool. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed making a drawing move on its own. And if you did, let me know. Click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And if you came across some cool idea of what you could do with a drawing in the background and an object moving across the top, let me know in the comments below what you drew. And until next time, stay curious, because the right question changes everything. Whoa.